Hello, welcome to Citizens Forum. It is Wednesday, September the 12th. I'd like to start by thanking our volunteer crew and the Shaw staff that makes this program happen every couple of weeks. Uh, our first guest is Kevin Taft. Kevin is the author of this book called Oil's Deep State, How the Petroleum Industry Undermines Democracy and Stops Action on Global Warming in Alberta and in Ottawa. So uh, Kevin was the former leader of the Liberal Party of Alberta, which is a small party in Alberta. Well, it was the official opposition. Oh, you were the, okay, yeah. the official opposition. <laughs> Great. So how the petroleum industry undermines democracy and stops action on global warming. What does that, I completely agree, but what does it mean? Well, when I was, uh, I've lived almost my entire life in Alberta. I ended up in the legislature and leader of the opposition for about five years. And uh, I would often have people say to me, well, the oil industry runs Alberta. Uh, and you might have people say, well, the oil industry runs BC or, you know, tries to run the whole country. And I think the question I'm exploring is, is that true? And if it's true, how do they do it? And when I uh, spent time drilling into that issue, the, what I realized is that the oil industry for about 25 years at least has focused very strategically on a series of institutions we have. So what I mean by institutions are formal, formal organizations like, uh, like political parties, a governing party, an opposition party, uh, or regulators, or the civil service, or the universities, or even media. The, even the media, exactly. Especially. And um, my argument is by slowly but steadily capturing those institutions, which are all set up to serve democracy, they all are supposed to have at their core a broad public interest. And by pulling those institutions into uh, serving the private interest of the oil industry, that that's effectively how they how they uh, run the run the province of Alberta, run the province of BC, and have so much influence in Canada. It's a very it's a very strategic campaign. It's been underway a very long time, and the oil industry has more or less, certainly by normal standards of ordinary Canadians, unlimited resources. I agree. Uh, I agree a hundred percent. I read. I read most of the book, and in there somewhere you mentioned a visit you had from somebody in the oil industry who gave you, I can't remember if you called it a veiled threat or just a little <laughs> advice, I don't remember, but maybe you can tell that. Sure, I remember that conversation very well. These are, you know, this particular conversation was with a very prominent uh, member of the oil industry at the time, and uh, I had met with him a few times as leader of the opposition. We were pushing, as we led up to the 2008 election, we were pushing for higher royalties in Alberta. And the industry, of course, didn't want that. The royalty is the, is the price that the governments charge for selling the resource that we, the people, own. Canadians own the resources in the ground through their provinces. And we sell those, and what we get back is called a royalty. And can uh, I, can I guess that they were rock bottom in they Alberta? They were rock bottom at that point uh, in Alberta, and they're still essentially here. On the oil sands, for example, it was uh, the initial royalties were 1%. So that means uh, for every 100 barrels of bitumen that were uh, produced in the oil sands, bitumen owned by the people of Alberta, the industry got the value from 99, and the people of Alberta got the value from 1. We were arguing and, and the, worldwide, that's probably very, very That's low. among, as far as I can, can learn from talking to royalty experts, the royalty regime in, in Alberta is among the lowest anywhere in, in anywhere, period. Um, anyways, back to this conversation. We had been calling for increases in royalties, campaigning on that basis. I'd had a, a handful of debate, shall we say, in, in back rooms with this particular fellow who represented the industry. And when he realized eventually that we weren't going to back down, he essentially said, and I, I spell it out in the book, uh, uh, listen, if you don't get with our program, uh, there are things we can do. You'll never know what happened, but there are things we can do to, 
you know, to to bring it out. Yeah. And uh, and he used a phrase like, "There will be no more no more Marquess of Queensbury rules," and which is a bit of an obscure phrase, but he used it. And essentially, it means they're not going to fight fair. They'll do whatever it takes to take us down. And in the end, he was as good as his word. You know, he walked out. I never saw him again. But uh, fairly quickly, as you, we got into that campaign, one of the things they did, among many, was the, the industry cut off all their donations to our political party. We were the official opposition trying to run for government. Um, and they did much the same, I must say, to the governing party, because under their new leader at the time, Ed Stelmack, the Conservatives, amazingly, had called also for higher royalties. So that's just a little example of the kind well, of raw muscle the industry has. That's not a little example. That's well, something we should all really think about. Because it, my, my recollection is that Ed Stelmack also disappeared very quickly. That's right. I mean, uh, uh, Ed and I were opponents, uh, very different on m many areas. But we were both calling for a uh, better return to the people of Alberta for the resource they were selling. Ed led his party to a majority, substantial majority victory. To be blunt, he kicked our butt, you know. Uh, but in two years, he was gone. And I was in the legislature through that process, and I could watch, watch as his power base was just cut, on, cut from under him by, uh, by various maneuvers from the industry. And quite quickly, an alternate third party arose, arose. which was largely, uh, uh, largely creation um, of the of the oil industry, as media, I spell out, and the book. media, no doubt, working. Well, yeah. sure, there was. Yeah. Um, so I think the thing. So the, the, and then the Liberals, your party. Yes, the Lib uh, certainly went down. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Wow. Well, folks, there you have it. That is the real truth about how democracy works in Canada. If you dare for one minute to stand up to the oil industry or God forbid the banks, or the big developers, or here in BC forestry, and the auto industry, and all the rest of them. If you dare, then politically, they will finish you off. And we've got to deal with that problem, because if we can't deal with it, things are not going to get any better in our country, I don't think. Yeah, so that's quite a story. Yeah, it's just, it is, it's one example of, uh, of many, I've had any number of people from BC, uh, as I spent time here, say they began reading the book and they could only read it one chapter at a time. They were loving the book, but it would make them so angry they could they just had to walk away from it. And then they'd come back and read another chapter and just be shocked and have to walk away from it again. Yeah. Well, maybe at that point in time we should hold the book up again. It's called <laughs> okay. Oil's Deep State. The author is Kevin Taft. Um, and and he, he calls them out. Once again, the subtitle is How the Petroleum Industry Undermines Democracy and Stops Action on Global Warming in Alberta and Ottawa and certainly in BC and the rest of the country. So we do have some questions to talk about. Maybe I'll, I'll kind of go around all of them and I'll say, what can we do? What do we have to do? I think it's really important that we not get discouraged. Um, people need to, first of all, get informed, understand, for example, I, I focus on, on global warming because it is uh, a serious threat to, to the global uh, ecology, the global environment, and it's something, uh, and this was particularly uh, hard for me to, to swallow as I researched, but the, the evidence is so clear that in the 1970s and 1980s and into the 1990s and even into the 2000s, the industry was clearly uh, clearly aware of the science. They, in fact, spent millions of dollars confirming the science and realizing that the use of fossil fuels is actually driving global warming. And then they did this reversal. It's kind of the tobacco industry approach of denying health effects from smoking, except it's on steroids with the oil industry. Uh, so through uh, through the 2000s and and until now uh, the industry has spent vast amounts of money literally tens and tens of millions of dollars to undermine the public understanding of global warming so the first thing people can do is just get confident go back go out and 
get it get to original uh, sources. Uh, I, I go to original sources in my book and get informed on issues, whether it's global warming or other things, and then get involved. We do, we do live in a democracy. We do have rights. We can do things here that you can't do in many countries of the world. And uh, people need to use those rights. They need to protest. They need to meet with their politicians. They need to work with political parties. They need to be engaged citizens for our democracy to continue to thrive. Okay, I'll disagree with you on one point there. That's because good. I don't think we do live in a democracy. Mm -hmm. I think, uh, I mean, there may be a few tattered threads remaining, <laughs> but that's about it. Because democracy is supposed to mean government of the people, by the people, and for the people. Yes. And, and if you look at Canada, my city government, my provincial government, my federal government, it doesn't matter what the people think. It, it, I mean, it's not important what I think, but what we collectively think is of no importance to our government. And I think the media is another part of it. They are even worse than the government in the way they manipulate us. But take the example of um, genetically modified foods. Mm -hmm. I think 80% of Canadians, the polls say, want them to be at least labeled. Yes. Right? But but it doesn't happen. So, you know, well, where's the democracy? I mean, those are all valid and serious points. I, if we give up on democracy, we're I'm basically I'm okay. saying let's get it. Okay, but let's well, not think we have it because well, we don't. Okay, but we need to work. We have the rules of democracy. We have at least the appearance of democracy. We do have competing political parties here. Uh, you know, up to a point, I'm. I'm you know, there are differences between the Greens in BC, say, and the BC Liberals. Um, and, and if we want them to become more vigorous, if we want them to differ more or to take different positions, in the end, I guess I'm a great believer in our own responsibility. We need to step forward and we need to get engaged and we need to work and we need to understand this is a contest. Sometimes we're going to lose. Once in a while we'll win, but if we don't get in, and, uh, and participate, we're defeated before we start. Well, I joined uh, the NDP a couple of, several years ago, because uh, for exactly those reasons. Yes. And forget it. I mean, there is nothing from the NDP to welcome me in. Um, they don't care. I'm talking about the leadership. Right. The membership is great, yeah. but the party's controlled by the leadership. And I mean, my MLA supports fracking, I guess, because we're doing it and they won't stop it. And fish, but the people where we live don't, I yeah. don't think, yeah. in James Bay. But so, you know, et cetera. Well, so we have to almost take so, over the political parties. Well, well, that's right. We do. And I mean, your MLA can be held to account at the next election. And in fact, I mean, having sat as an MLA, I know that when I had you know, if I had a group of well-informed, highly motivated people come in to meet me while I was an MLA and put forward a, a serious position, I paid attention. That's why you're not an MLA anymore. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I, I just believe that, uh, you know, we, we can't we give up. Yeah, we can't give we agree, up on the yeah. system. We can't... Uh, I tell you, I'd much rather be a political activist, as it were, in various forms in Canada than in Saudi Arabia or Russia or Venezuela or anywhere else. Um, you know, and I return to this point, which I think is, a, is, a, is an amazing one. I spent several years as leader of the opposition, I, more than 11 years in the opposition. It was called Her Majesty's Loyal Opposition. And the notion there is amazing. I was paid try to overthrow the government. I was considered loyal and still in opposition to the government. And it's, it's, uh, it's, a, it's a remarkable concept. It, that's not how it works in most of the world. But when you really tried to do something, and so did the Premier, to raise royalty rates, the, the iron <laughs> fist came out of the... Kevin, thank you very much. Very, very interesting. Uh, Kevin is speaking in Victoria tonight, which is uh, September the 12th. And um, we'll talk again. Thank you very much. Thanks for watching this segment of Citizens Forum.
Welcome to the Citizens Forum. My name is Walt McGinnis. And today I have with me uh, in the studio a man that needs no introductions here in Victoria, as far as I'm concerned. It's Sid Taffler. And uh, Sid is, uh, is a journalist, uh, the former editor of the Bundy Magazine. And um, Sid has just opened a, or created a new website called The Record, in which uh, He's recorded all the voting records of all the city councillors and the mayor in Victoria, amongst other things. Now, also the, the records engaged in a GoFundMe uh, fundraising campaign, and uh, we'll put that URL up. So if you feel like this is a good idea, please visit the, the website and, and donate. So welcome to the show, Sid. Thank you, Walt. So, okay. Why did you think that this was needed to record these votes? Well, I, I, I'm just looking around recently and I, 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 look, I go to some council meetings and there's a lot of good stories generally that aren't being covered. So I felt, well, let's do a website to try to get some election coverage. And then one of the first things I thought of was, well, the voting record. Because if you go into the ballot and you look at a bunch of names, and you don't know how they voted, well, how can you decide how you want to vote? Do these people vote your values? And, and if they do, maybe you want to vote for them. And so without a voting record, I think it's very difficult to decide. Yeah, the people really don't know how it's going. And, and I've gone to council meetings, and they'll make a vote. And I'll be asking somebody beside me, how did, who voted? How did, did that, was that done now? Yeah. yeah, it's all finished. And it's like you're moving on to something else. And you realize that, you're just wondering, was democracy served in this case, you know? Yeah. Now, can you hold up the, 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 the actual... Sure. The, this, is, this is the chart. I don't know if the, our camera guy... Hold it up a little higher, like that. And uh, this is uh, just a schedule of all the voting over the last several years of all the mayors and yeah. councillors. Very interesting to see uh, the percentages of uh, pro-development councillors on, on the city uh, staff, the city hall, when uh, sometimes the rhetoric doesn't match the voting. So anyway, let's uh, just set that aside for sure. now, Sid. I think this is so important because it's a yeah. good start. Now, from your uh, views and what you've been able to discern so far, um, who do you think's ahead in this election for the mayor? Can I just clarify something yeah. about our voting record? I, yeah. I want to make the point, there are hundreds and hundreds of developments that come before council. and. Most of them pass unanimous because they're fairly small. So we just cho chose what we call major developments. Okay. So there's about 40 of them in the, four, in the four years. And that's, I think, more reflective of how people vote. Uh, and so in terms of who, who's ahead, right now, in terms of the poll we've done, uh, it's Stephen Hammond is, is well ahead uh, in first okay. place. The mayor is in second. And then there's four or five other candidates below. So this, this actually comes as, as a surprise to me. I knew there's some dissension over the mayor's record, but I actually expected in his first poll early on her to lead. And it's, so yeah. it's a major surprise. I don't think I can easily explain it, except that, you know, I know that Mr. Hammond is with an organization called Mad as Hell, which I, I would never name my organization that, but maybe a lot of people in Victoria are Mad as Hell, and maybe that's why he's doing so well right now. Well, you know, everybody's, mad uh, you know yeah. about some things yeah. if you look at how things go in general in politics not only not only in the municipal elections but also provincially and federally yeah. we're not being respected the voters are not being listened to doesn't matter what uh political stripe you're coming from a lot of sort of underlying resentment is there and i've seen that right across the board so perhaps this is what we're seeing playing out here in this election I think we expect a lot of our politicians, and when they don't do what we, any of us, want, we can get upset. We're living in an age where people can be quite cranky. Social media fits that and so yeah. on. When I look at the job of the mayor, I, I, I think, wow, that's tough. There are so many areas you have to be an expert in. But I think there is that perception here that to some extent people aren't being listened to. You find it in development. You find it in uh, even the way the bike lanes were designed yeah. and how the businesses were affected. You find it in, in, in other areas as well, such as with the homeless situation, and people feel unprotected, they feel unsafe. And yeah. a lot of people rightly or wrongly think that, that, that City Hall is not representing how they feel the city should be run. You know, it's so interesting because like the Sir John A. McDonald statue yeah. 
controversy that went on in the summertime, which was really overblown in my view, but yeah. nevertheless, um, I think that polarized a lot of the public into looking at this issue. And I don't know if they actually, the public actually learned what the core issues were. It just became down to almost like, well, we had that statue there and he's a first prime minister of, uh, of Canada, why not keep it there? And But I don't think people really were able to dwell into the representation that that statue was. Now, if you were a First Nations person and you were going into City Hall yeah. and you got to look at the guy that created the Indian Act, you know, yeah. how are you going to feel about how you're going to be treated inside this building? Yeah. But I, the, the way it went down was 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 I found very interesting was uh, the certainty that that Mayor Helps and others had that they were doing the right thing. Yeah. But somehow they were just missing all the nuances in the in the situation. Yeah, you know, it's a very complicated issue. I think you summarized it quite well. Uh, and so, uh, and the mayor initially said, we're making the right decision, we're doing it properly. And then she realized there was a tremendous amount of blowback and people upset about it. So now she's saying, well, maybe we didn't do it the way we should have. Maybe, we, she said to me, it's, it became too much of a city hall led process rather than a citizen led process. Yeah. To a lot of us, that seemed obvious. And you wonder, she's very bright. She thinks outside the box, very in of, innovative sometimes you wonder how she can miss a, an important step like that so yeah and, I, and again i've seen it in other instances where she had to yeah. apologize for not consulting the businesses on fourth street about the bike lanes uh so you know sometimes her political instincts are aren't right on and she thinks i think she thought she was doing the right thing yeah but the rest of us weren't brought in on it. And I think most of us feel reconciliation should involve all of us, not just the leaders. And it's a process. I mean, how are we going to resolve colonialism and yes. 400 years of oppression? Yeah. It's not going to happen by taking a statue on. Yeah. But there's, the thing is that if we are allowed to, to I think, I think uh, Elizabeth May was, said something quite wise. She said that, that removing the statue smacked of uh, sort of... Um, Revenge, you kind of, or colonialism in itself, yeah. You know, like yeah. instead of instead of maybe looking into this and just looking into the the, the whole consciousness of the of the community, yeah. we just sort of got it polarized, and now we're getting into election cycles, and I think this polarization is being played out, um, where uh, is Mr. Hamill? Is it? Yeah. He he led the the uh, group that were really opposed to how. Um, this housing crisis is trying to be solved in Victoria yes. by creating these uh, these places for people to go, yeah. and uh, without really fully consulting the neighborhoods, and That's I think correct. that a lot of people in those neighborhoods really felt disrespected. Yes. yes. So there again, you have a, a kind of a rush to a solution. Let's say, yeah. when maybe a little more process could have worked much better in the long run. If I can go back to the indigenous yeah. question for a minute. We have a lot to be proud of, even though our, our history has, has difficulties. Right now, I would say to some extent, by putting it in the Constitution, by having the Truth yeah. and Reconciliation Commission, by admitting that we have to seek a new path, we, I think we kind of lead the world. Now, what I think is important is instead of worrying about Sir John A, who can't defend himself, he's long gone, we have to look at our behavior today. Yeah. to see how we are treating indigenous people in the city of Victoria, our neighbors and so on, and the original people who lived here. And that, that's, that's where we have to start from. We have to, sometimes I go to, a, uh, to an indigenous community on the outskirts of Victoria and I say they don't, the children don't have a crosswalk on a busy street. Mm -hmm. And I think in, a, in, a, in a, another kind of neighbor, they automatically would. So we have, we have a lot to do about our own behavior uh, whether it's indigenous people shopping in our stores or, or whatever, and whether we're hiring them or whether they yeah. can get a physician in town. We have to look at that and, and, and move ahead now. And I'm glad that the city is taking some leadership. They just have to do it by including the rest of us as well. Yeah, exactly. And, you know, uh, we have a chance here. And I think in Canada, we have a chance to actually try to create a new society, really, yeah. that, that brings in and includes everyone not only First Nations, but everyone. Canada has such a multicultural yeah. richness that really makes the country, I yeah. think, very, very strong. But if anyway, I say one other thing sure. about that is that, it, 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 talk about the process, but a lot of people don't realize. We expect city council to do most of their business in public. Yeah. And they, have, they, they hold sometimes between 30 and 40 private meetings 
private city council meetings a year, and often we don't know what happened in those meetings. And this process of this city family, which made the decision about the statute, that was done behind closed doors. And they continue to meet behind closed doors. So we don't know what else is on the agenda. We don't know if we're going to get another decision sprung on us. And I, I think we have to open up those doors and we have to know what's going on at City Hall. And uh, I think 30, 30, 35 or 40 uh, private in-camera meetings a year is just too many. You know, how is that decided? So do you know how, what, what sort of criteria are they using in order to decide to go behind closed doors? They used to have only a few criteria, but yeah. courtesy of the provincial government some years ago, they, they can have just about anything. It can be personnel, it can be intergovernmental relations, which is very broad, it can be all kinds of finance. Yeah. So just about anything they, they can hold closed meetings about. And, you know, I th I'm, in, I'm in favor of sunlight and open doors, and we all should know, and then we can respect the process and feel yeah. good about it. But they're going to continue. They're going to meet. The city family is going to meet again uh, late September, and suppose, I, I'm quite sure behind closed doors again. And sometimes there's a need for it, but I just think uh, there, it's, there's too much of that. I agree entirely. Yeah. And um, but anyway, let's just move sure. on to a couple of other issues sure. about these elections. Sure. Now um, we're just looking at the incumbents here. So uh, are we looking at the the new candidates, and are we trying to rate them in any way at all? Oh, that's very fair. That's very fair as well. I, I, we've had a lot of focus on the incumbents. We've only been on online now for two weeks. We have another five weeks yeah. to the election. You can be sure we're going to take a hard look at the challengers. They don't have a voting record, but they have a record in life. Yeah. And we're going to look at that very carefully. We're going to demand answers for them. To the people who feel that we need new people, that's your prerogative, but be yeah. careful that any new people you do vote for are appropriate and are, have been vetted and will do the job properly. Yeah, you know, that. So sometimes you throw the baby out with the bathwater yeah. and when you're trying to make changes. If you think about what happened in the United States recently, you might you know, so true, think about yeah. that. So, true. so anyway, um, what do you think are the, you know, the most important key issues that should, the voters should be looking at in Victoria? Well, my point of view, from my point of view, I don't know everybody shares this, it's development because that's what they have a tremendous amount of power over. I mean, the homeless thing is a big thing, but they only can solve part of that. They can't give these people jobs and whatever. So development to me carries everything. It's, it's traffic, it's where your kids are going to go to school, it's where you're going to live and whether we have homeless people. So yeah. I think we have a council that develops a lot of high-end housing or let's say approves a lot of high-end housing and not enough of what we might call affordable housing. So all those approvals we're seeing and you see about 40 of them in the chart, yeah. uh, many of them, too many of them I think are high-end and I think they have to bring incentives for more affordable housing and then they also have to capture more benefit. Other cities, when they allow for upzoning, they capture benefit from the development community. We don't do enough of that. And we don't get the integration of the provincial and federal governments really getting involved yeah. in the provincial and federal housing programs like they used to have, by yes. the way. The excellent programs. I remember back in the 90s in Vancouver, a friend of mine moved into sort of a an apartment complex and uh, it was all designated uh, for part of that was going to go to uh, low income and income assisted people. Yeah. Um, those uh, were incredibly successful. Yeah. Uh, it also brought people together, yes. brought different strata of societies together a little yeah. closer. And uh, it just made it a much richer sort of a community for them. I think I'd like to add that both levels of government, provincial and federal, are going to get much more involved in the process. And whoever is at city, city council in the next term will have much more of that kind of money available for that. So, so we'll have a, hopefully more affordable housing being built in the city. Yeah, I, I, I agree. And I know Jack and I have talked about it so many times. I mean, it's, it's one of those fundamental blocks of, of a civilized society is to have a, a place to live, a safe place. Uh, a warm place and uh, to live and, and, uh, yeah. and security. And from that springs all sorts of possibilities for the people living in those good houses. And we're just now cast, it's almost the other way where more and more people are losing their security. Yeah. It's very, very serious. Anyway, Sid, we're gonna have to wrap it up for today. Uh, I just wanna make sure that, um, that we're going to be able to uh, have your website up, but what, can you just tell us what your website is, just verbally? It's called The Record, and the address is victoriarecord.com. .com. victoriarecord.com. Okay. I think it's up on the screen.
Thank you so much for coming in, thank Sid. You I really want to thank you for doing what you're doing. You're welcome. So uh, that completes this segment of Citizens Forum. Welcome back. It's Wednesday, September the 12th. My guest in this segment is Isadora Godchild. In the past, we've talked about housing, Isadora, and we're going to continue with are. renovations and demolitions. And I'll just say the housing situation in our city and our province and our country is a disaster. I think it's been deliberately done, the whole thing, the creation of the homelessness, deliberately done, the creation of the high house prices and the high rents deliberately done. We're paying, look who's getting. It is absolutely crazy. Um, and you know, that's, that's just the, the situation. So renovations and demolitions. Well, as I mentioned in a previous show, it's kind of like a, a conscious cruelty in a way because uh, the, it was the uh, central mortgage and housing that stopped building uh, affordable housing uh, about 20 years ago, 25 years ago, somewhere there. We should just say what that means because it used to be that the government of Canada built that's housing. Right. That's so we had right. enough housing. That's right. What yes. they've done now is they've turned it over to the private sector and they've said, yep. hey, if there's a shortage of housing mm -hmm. one way or the other, then we can push prices up mm -hmm. and we are going to make fortunes. Mm -hmm. And that's exactly what they've done. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And two-pronged the housing industry made sure there was a shortage mm -hmm. and the government helped them in every way possible including the government stopped building housing which they used to and they used to build great housing and they, finance housing absolutely they did absolutely and that is um it was uh, r very intentional and uh, really compounded the problem and our basic necessities became a luxury you know that only the, the wealthy can afford, right? Isn't it crazy? And I know, and as I said, affordable, affordable has also been, can, you can redefine it as affordable for the people who can afford it, right? I mean, so you don't even know whether that's even, uh, you know, uh, something they're really building because they can say affordable now, but who, what does that really mean anymore? Before it meant that your, your rent was what, 30% of your, of your income, which is now 70 or 75% of your income just to have a roof over your head. And so, like I said, it's like the, uh, our basic necessities have become uh, very um, exclusive luxuries, so to speak, you know. And we're... we're and not by accident. Not at all. No, because, as we said, the central mortgage and housing stopped building. So, renovations and demolitions. Yes. So, as I said, this is part of compounding the problem of already homelessness as it is. And this kind of reared its ugly head about 10 years ago in 2008. And just for a few examples, uh, in Vancouver, uh, this uh, Seafield Apartments, it was an 80-year-old building, but it was like a absolutely strongly built. It was made out of brick, it was, but it was just a, a really solid building. And this, um, it was bought um, by uh, this Gordon Nelson Incorporated in 2008. And shortly after they bought it, they started issuing eviction notices to all the 24 tenants. So um, after a long drawn out battle in 2011, they won. They got to stay in their place, wow. but it took what's from 2008 to 2011 because it was counter. You know, they would put there, and then they would the the company would uh, wow. peel this, and it kind of went back and forth like that. But they won, so victory for them. So they won in 2011, but that's 2011. I don't know if there's any you know what update or what's happened since then. Then uh, 2016 in Victoria. Uh, Douglas Street building was bought by Starlight Investments out of Toronto. They are a um, kind of a conglomerate out of Toronto and as soon as they bought um, in Victoria the rent eviction notice started appearing on the doors and then shortly after that it was, they, had a, they had a meeting which was hosted by NDP MLA Carol James 
and she and she was um, she had hosted the meeting and about 200 people showed up and David David Ebby was also there um, but and it and the meeting basically said as it stands now there's really uh, nothing in the residential tenancy act that protects renters from rent evictions and it's becoming more and more commonplace um, and it was also stated that you can get, you know, you can get uh, Starlight uh, Investments to write guarantees that there'll be no rent evictions. But uh, he said it's probably written; it's not even worth written on the paper it's written on, so to speak. Yeah. Um, and Starlight bought up six buildings in Victoria. I will give a little, a um, uh, little background on them shortly. And then to, uh, 2017, this uh, another um, corporation, Headwater Projects, they bought four multifamily buildings in 2016 in Victoria, and the same story. They bought it, uh, and uh, they uh, and it comes down to the um, mantra of acquire, evict, and renovate, kind of a thing. And but it generated media attention, but the, and so. It also alerted City Hall, finally, who is, you can guess by this time, they're asleep at the wheel. Right? Boy, are, they, are they ever. Not only asleep at the wheel, but here, let us help. Yeah, yeah exactly. And the provincial so, government, too, of So course. they put on a, a moratorium of six months for no demolitions because they saw that real estate investors were literally gobbling up the um, apartment buildings, the affordable heart, you know, the ones that were affordable, and they got them, you know, f fairly cheap. And um, then uh, in 2018, the same thing, the Headwater Project, same story again, rent evictions of tenants, and this is, was the headline for this one, and this actually was, you know, in, the, in Times Colonist, there. Tenants battling rent evictions, and yes. some are winning. Yes. At, like to me, the Times yeah. colonist is definitely the enemy on this issue because this disaster has taken place over a period of 50 oh, to 20 years. At least. And at least. Basically, the media kept. It. I mean, there was a plan in place to push up prices mm -hmm. and also create mm -hmm. a shortage, mm -hmm. which is why we have so many homeless people, because we have a shortage of That's housing. That's correct. The shortage of housing is partly because they underbuild mm -hmm. and partly because they've allowed the entire world to come in and speculate That's on correct. our homes. Yeah. So anybody in the world who wants to invest money, house prices in Canada have been going up 10 or 15 percent mm -hmm. a year, mm -hmm. year mm -hmm. after year after year. There's no better deal than that anywhere in the world. Right? <laughs> yeah, I so know, I know. But invite the world to I come know. in, no taxes, no rules. And where was the yeah. Times colonists when all of that was happening? Exactly. They didn't care. Yeah, and right. neither did CFAX and neither did CBC because this is the plan. Mm -hmm. Where we are now with this disaster of homelessness mm -hmm. and high house prices and high rents and rent evictions, mm -hmm. that's the plan. Mm -hmm. Because some people have made a lot of money out of this. Mm -hmm. yep. We just yep. don't know it because nobody ever tells us. But none of this has happened by us. We're the second biggest country in the world exactly. with a population of only 35 I million people. I know, and you think of it. every yeah, natural resource. Yeah. But we can't build enough houses for the people yeah. who live here. Yeah. What yeah. what a surprise, what a surprise. What I know. know. And, the, and the, the guy who was being, I mean, he did, um, some of the people were winning, and this, uh, the um, Together Against Poverty Society was stepped in, you know, I guess they contacted them to help him or whatever, get that, and they're a great group that uh, Together Against uh, Poverty Society, and <clears throat> anyways, he's the 70-year-old, he's retired, he lives in an old age pension, his rent is $728, $728, but if it would, once it's renovated, it goes double, almost double, 1,425 for the same place with probably a little paint and you know, like that, you know, kind of a thing. And the, the Headwater projects, and what they've been doing is purchasing these buildings, but they're getting them at dirt cheap prices, like a three or four story apartment building for three to three point million, one million bucks or something like that. So, you know, sometimes, some places you can't even buy a house for that amount of money right in some areas and so they said it was re there was um then they said there's no real reason to evict them it's a cash grab you know what is what it boils down to so um 
So then, in uh, again, okay, Starlight Investments, so they bought that. And then um, uh, the Headwater Projects um, bought another, so they bought four multi family complexes in, um, in um, uh, Victoria. Then, uh, but then, as we, you, you were saying, that they, um, they can't build enough housing for people, yet at the same time, as I mentioned earlier, is that there is m major developments going on. Vancouver Devel unleashed new real estate projects multi-billion dollar developments starting or expanding in Bayview and Roundhouse Victoria West by Focus Equities. But they aren't for affordable. Nothing, there's nothing remotely uh, resembles uh, affordable housing here. Lots, lots for the wealthy and the, the rich that come in here. And as I also mentioned, um, in 2017, there was $117 billion in total building permits in 2017. In BC. In, B, in v, BC, yeah. yeah. Or, yeah it's one of the biggest parts of our, of, our, of our economy now is the housing industry. It's, oh, it's, huge. And it's yet huge. there's not enough houses. <laughs> I know. Well, that's it, because they're building... Um, and they're selling. Like, in Vancouver, the number, I think the official numbers, I, I could be wrong, but I think these are the official numbers from the city of Vancouver. In the greater Vancouver area, they estimate between 40 and 60,000 vacant homes. In the yes. greater Vancouver area, between 40 and 60,000 vacant homes. That's what they think. So look what they've done. I mean, look what they've done. Uh, that's enough to solve all the problems five times Absolutely. over. Absolutely, yeah. But where is this $117 billion in building permits in BC going, right? I mean, you know, what are they doing with that? You know, that, that alone could build all kinds of affordable housing just for the permits that big corporations and stuff are building. And this, and this, um, um, this Starlight um, is, is a kind of a small behemoth out of Toronto, and they have just recently um, affiliated now with Blackstone um, Property Partners, and they're out of America. And get a load of this, they have, they have uh, a portfolio of $120, $120 billion in investment capital in real estate portfolio. What's the name of the company? That's Blackstone, um, Blackstone U uh, Property Partners, and they've affiliated now with, uh, with uh, Starlight which is out of Toronto. So now they're getting, so now they're, they're starting to amalgamate and affiliate and their, their, um, their uh, motto or whatever it is says they have an invested interest in, invested interest in creating value and ensuring each property achieves maximum return. <laughs> <laughs> On their investments, yeah. <laughs> right? So the, the guy's thinking it, it kind of reminds me of mum, maximum, <laughs> maximum. <laughs> yeah, totally. So you can oh, see God. dollar yeah. sign yeah, clicking yeah. in. Uh, they just you know, created so. this. I mean, they've they've doubled and tripled yes. the price of you know one of the necessities in life. Well, Look as what, I said, and, and they're just raking yeah. in the money. Our human and we're out of time. Yeah. Okay, and uh, basically, I said our human rights are ba are now uh, luxuries. But there are definitely solutions. For example, yeah. Site C. If we stopped Site C, we've got oh, eight to ten billion dollars totally. we could spend on housing. Absolutely. Solutions yeah. are there. Thank you very much yeah. for watching this segment Thank of you. Citizens Forum. Thank you. <laughs> Welcome back to Citizens Forum, and uh, we're going to have a segment here between Jack and I. We call it the Walt and Jack Show, in which we try to uh, figure out some of the events that have happened over the last couple of weeks. And sometimes we bring in clippings, and sometimes we don't. But anyway, we have a few topics we want to cover off. And I'm wondering, Jack, what have you brought in that's top of your mind? Well, I want to start off with the situation with the, uh, the tent city in Saanich, as they call it, the place... Now, first of all, we should not have any homelessness in this country. It's absolutely crazy. But given the disaster that we have, the amount of anger and almost hate and division that CFAX has been focusing for months on these poor
poor people, yeah. pitying them against the neighbors. Yeah. And I mean, the neighbors are suffering badly from this too, but CFAX doesn't care about the homeless people or the neighbors or the community. They want the division. And that's what it's all about. I mean, it just goes on and on and on. There are solutions and there are reasons why this happens. They never talk about any of that. Yeah. It's just the division. You know, and yeah. of course, the, they divide the environmentalists against the community by giving misinformation about the Kinder Morgan pipeline. They attack Muslim people. You know, it just, it, it just, I, I don't know. We've got to deal with this issue of the corporate controlled media yeah. and the problems they cause in our society. It is a disaster. No doubt about it, and they're they're uh, they're not an unbiased observer. They're they're they have vested interests in the outcomes of all these events, and uh, with the high housing crisis, if you're already in the market, and if you if you're a developer, or if you're into uh, the industry, like I'm in the construction industry, and it's great, we got lots of work to do, but nevertheless, we're not solving anything, and uh, when our when our media doesn't provide a forum like that to actually let other ideas come in and, and look for, for other ways, then we're always going to be locked in this constant battle and never really finding a way forward. So I, I agree with you on that. I think we, we just have to find a better way. Number two. Well, I brought in a couple of things. Um, uh, this is off the, off the internet. Um, one thing that I just noticed was, um, I'll just hold this up and we might get a better shot of it online, but um, it's, a, it's a story about uh, in the Havana, in, in Cuba and Havana, the American embassy, uh, the workers in the American embassy are getting very sick. Uh, the New York Times and others have reported on it as being some type of a sonic attack, which is not a scientific sort of analysis whatsoever. Now. I got thinking about this, and years ago, the American Embassy in Moscow also had their employees all getting ill, and they were all hearing noises and things like that. Now, uh, what the scientists are talking about, and, and, and this article here that I hope you, you're able to see uh, if you go online, that there's a, we had, they had a, a researcher look at what was causing these problems, and then she said that this is, in fact, uh, uh, a microwave radiation sort of illness that people are being exposed to radio frequency radiation, not uh, not unlike what we're seeing in the env our environments right now, but maybe at a higher intensity. And these and the people inside the embassy are being affected. And they're hearing noises in their heads, for instance, clicking and buzzing and all these things. And that's well reported in other literature as an effect of having radiation pointed at your head. Um, I think the, the interesting thing about it is that the power levels that, the, um, that uh, they're experiencing is not above what's allowed in our environment by the American government and the Canadian government. So it's, I think they're in this predicament where they are allowing very high levels of exposure for like the cell phone radiation and Wi-Fi and such. But they're at the same time seeing the effect of this level of exposure on their own workers in their embassy. So they're stuck. They can't really come out and say what exactly is really happening. And uh, a lot of people are suffering in these cases where, you know, sometimes these illnesses are debilitating, if not chronic. So, um, Not that the deep state cares about any of these people. Well, they're having a hard time covering it up. Yes, that, that may be, yes. And you see, you see it coming out. Now, there are, it, on, on the website, Electromagnetic Radiation Safety, they have uh, the, the titles for 26,000 studies now showing some sort of harm between, uh, some sort of association between uh, exposure to electromagnetic radiation, such as cell phone, Wi-Fi, and things of that nature, and all a whole array of illnesses. You know, there's just it's just astonishing. And you could talk about some of the big ones like autism, uh, and cancer, and Alzheimer's, and some of the big illnesses we're seeing. So a lot of them, like uh, 
Alzheimer's and uh, Parkinson's and... Uh, well, all those are the symptoms. What, what the radiation causes is damage to our body. It yeah. can come out in a thousand different ways depending on who you are and you know, how, you, how you react. So but that's, an bad for that's our a health. very, uh, it's, it's something I follow very carefully, but, but in the end, uh, the science is there. You know, there's uh, 26,000 publications, 6,000 separate summaries, all discussing ill health effects. So we're in a situation that is so strange where the scientific evidence is there, mountains of it, and still our regulators are setting back and saying the jury is out or whatever, okay. whatever terms they're using. So you said it's strange, but maybe we should go deeper into it because really it's not strange at all. It's, it's the way yeah. our country works. I think it is strange in the sense that um, for the public, and this is something that always has preoccupied me, is, is where hard factual information, the very best you can get, and uh, scientific studies that have been designed well, and you can go through the through the abstracts, and you can see how how much time is spent gathering this data. But it's dismissed with one little article in the New York Times. Oh, the jury is out, and it's all forgotten about. And we're in a situation where, if we can't move ahead on this issue with the information we have, then we're basically we can't move ahead on anything because this is the best research you can possibly get. Yeah. And the research says we have to do something to save our Precisely. lives. Precisely. But, but our governments and the media refuse to do anything. The media doesn't inform us and the governments don't act, except to allow it to get even worse. Yeah. You know, it, it's, it's, it, it's a reflection of the total insanity of our current society. And if we can't change it, then really it, it's like they're going to destroy us and they don't care. You know, another, I, I brought in another thing because, of course, this is September 12th today, isn't it? And it is. September 11th was yesterday. September 11th was yesterday. 2001. That's uh, 17 years ago. Yeah. Uh, somebody attacked the United States of America in 2000, uh, September uh, 11th, 2001. It never was ever, nobody ever found out who did it. That's very true. Uh, if you look at, at this incident... Osama bin Laden was never charged by the FBI because there was no evidence. <laughs> yeah. the, the FBI never charged him. Um, and the number of serious questions about what happened on that day are huge, but it's like it doesn't matter. The media refuses to report on yeah. it, and nobody in a position of power dis dares to say anything because if you dare to say anything about that, your career is finished if yeah. you, you know, have a serious career. You're somewhere. not on the team. The thing is, is that... I mean, there's so much, I mean, it's, it was a cultural change in globally because I think people that, that really do are really concerned with the truth and the facts uh, and spend a lot of time gathering that evidence, the mountains of evidence that uh, it was impossible for some guy in a cave in Afghanistan with a cell phone. Who was a, a former CIA employee. Yeah. <laughs> right. And he orchestrated and coordinated all these events on that day. I, I spent a, lot, a little while reading 9-11 Truth last night on their website. If you got time, you should go and read it just to refresh the facts in your mind of exactly what occurred and how the official story is so implausible. The, the official story. Now, what I always thought about this was is that, you know, just looking at this issue and you see all the... Uh, factual, you know, just there's just nothing consistent about the, the official story, that it was so ham-fisted, it was so poorly covered up. Well, but not that. I mean, they, you know, you know the, what they did was a, a magnificent job of destruction and cover-up. Well, they didn't actually cover it up. And this is what I'm trying to say, is that they're, they're, if you look at it, you look at millions and millions of people feel about this the same way I do, including... 75% of New Yorkers. But it doesn't matter. This is it. Doesn't that matter. they rub it in. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like they say to us, we know you know that we did it, but we know you can't do anything about it. Yeah. And, and I think that's important that we should all think about that is that they, they are telling us that they, they robbed up from us any sovereignty or any, any 
chance of acting in a democratic way and make decisions. Now, Canada isn't the United States, but um, we can see what happened to the United States you know, since 2001 and look at what we have here, the most bizarre situation I've ever witnessed in my life anywhere in the world. So I think we can't forget about 9-11. You have to keep in your mind that this, this was, um, it had to be some type of an inside job. It just doesn't make any sense otherwise. Well, last night on a radio show called Coast to Coast AM, which is big in the United States and Canada, uh, they had on, I can't remember his name, but he's the leader of a group called Architects and Engineers for 9-11 Truth. Architects and Engineers for 9-11 Truth. And there's 3,000 uh, members of that group. And they say that the official story of the buildings collapsing, the two buildings collapsing because they were hit by an airplane, is impossible. Yeah. And uh, it's also impossible for the third building that collapsed that day, which was 47 stories tall, building number seven. They say that, they say it was all controlled demolitions. Now this is 3,000 architects and engineers, but it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter for one second because the media will not cover the story and no politician dares to act, which just shows how complete the insanity is. And 9-11 led to how many wars, the deaths of millions of people, the creation of ISIS, the destruction of Libya, Syria, Iraq, and Afghanistan, yeah. and now the refugee crisis that's destabilizing Europe. All of it came from this act. And, you know, they have the power to do that. And that's the way these people who run the world, that's how they play the game. You know, the U.S. US policy almost anywhere, domestic or foreign, uh, it doesn't make any sense uh, in, in a logical fashion. If one would say this is a, a national government and they're going to look out after the interests of the people that live in that country, it's obvious that they're going to make decisions on, on trade or uh, on international relations. They're, going to, they're looking out after their own interests. Nothing, no decisions that have been made in the United States in the last 50 years is in the interests of Americans. The economy is non-existent. They can never pay back what they owe. And, and they're spending trillions of dollars on, on a military. Well, who's, who are they fighting? They're, 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 their expenditures on military are like, put everybody else together and we're like 10% of the military spending and there's 90% by the Americans. So that's got so out of whack. They're, they're forced to spend money on this military that goes around and beats up everybody all around the world in the name of democracy and all that. This is really, you know, they're looking out at the interests of oil interests and other large corporate interests. And uh, the Americans are paying. And uh, yeah, they the had, people are paying. Yeah. They had a chance with Bernie Sanders, and Bernie could have won the last election. Hillary Clinton decided that Bernie wasn't going to be the, that candidate, Hillary Clinton and the Democratic Party. Uh, instead, the public, knowing just how corrupt the, the, the whole Clinton family was and, 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 and Hillary Clinton, could, they couldn't bring themselves to vote for Hillary Clinton. That's the story, Jack. 56 million Americans couldn't, couldn't stand voting for her. So they voted for Donald Trump. And look, now we see the fiasco that that caused. And we're out of time. We're out of time. Anyway, so... But that's uh, the reality. Stay plugged into 9-11, folks. Don't give up. Uh, the truth will prevail. So that's it for this uh, week uh, for Citizens Forum. Thank you for watching.